You are listening to the Sinister Story Hour, a true crime podcast that dives into a new case each week. Here we talk about crime, cults, conspiracies, and all things sinister. If you enjoy the show, like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. You can find us on Instagram and TikTok at Sinister Story Hour and on Twitter at Sinister Hour. As always, you can support the show for as little as 99 cents per month. Hey guys, have you thought about making your own podcast, but you're not really sure where to start? That's how I was at first, and really the only choice that stood out to me was Anchor. And let me tell you why. It was completely free to start, and it has all the tools that allow me to record and edit my podcast right from my phone or computer. And they distribute the podcast for me, so it's heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. There's no minimum listenership, and you can start making money from day one. And really, everything you need to make your podcast is all in one place. I love it, and I know you will too. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. One other thing I wanted to get into before we get to our story. I know that as a podcast listener, you probably are not just listening to the Sinister Story Hour. And as much as I want you to exclusively be mine, I understand that you need other podcasts in your life. And if you do, please make it this one. It is hilarious. It's called The End. He actually reviews books, but the catch is that he has not read the book. He's reading the very ending and the last page of the book. It's hilarious. The delivery, him, everything about it is just a really, really good concept and a really funny, funny show. So um, like I said, he's only on the third episode, so I truly believe that that show is going to go some places. So get over there, check it out. Thank you so much for being a new pal, Eli, and I just wish you and your wife and your baby the best, and thank you so much. Hello, folk music fans. Gordon Lightfoot is one of the greatest folk rock artists ever, and now there's a podcast celebrating and discussing his work song by song. It's called Carefree Highway Revisited, and every episode, your host, that's me, Mike Messner, will examine one of Gordon's songs with the help of a special guest. So, if that's your cup of tea, why don't you follow us on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or TuneIn. That's Carefree Highway Revisited. Well, hello, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Stephanie with Sinister Story Hour. And as always, welcome if this is your first time here. Thank you so much for joining me. If it's not, welcome back. Thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate all of you for listening and just being a part of our community that we have happening. So I love that so much. As a warning, in my everyday life, guys, I am a safety coordinator. I give safety trainings. I onboard people, uh, new employees and things like that to a company. And I have been talking a lot all week long. And so I do sound like I'm barely going through puberty and my voice is changing. And I'm terribly sorry for that. No, I'm not sick. No, it's not something serious, but I definitely have lost my voice just a little bit. So there are times when you will hear that today. And I'm sorry for that. But it's not going away. It's not getting better. It was a very long week. I hope all of you fared well through your week. And hopefully this episode serves as just a good end to the week. So I'm so glad to be putting it out. Finally, this episode took a ton of research and a ton of time to research. And so there are hours and hours and hours of research going into this episode. So hopefully you all enjoy it. What else is there? I'm freezing. It's Sunday. It's late afternoon. I'm wrapped in my Snuggie with the space heater on. And it's definitely fall, friends. It is here. We actually are just barely starting school. We got a little reprieve from the rest of the world. It feels like the rest of the world went back to school a long time ago. And we are starting this Wednesday. Football has already started. And if you know me, you know this girl loves some football. So I'm very excited about having football season back, praying that my son stays healthy all season and we can continue to do that. And it's just been such a fun time. If you follow me on Instagram, you have seen football pictures already. I'm terribly sorry, but you are going to have to get used to them. So that's probably what's going to happen all year. Speaking of Instagram, yes, I said it. Go follow us. 
We are in Sinister Story Hour on Instagram and TikTok. You can find us on Twitter at Sinister Hour. And as always, you can send us a Gmail and send us all of your spooky stories. We're going into spooky season, you guys. You have to have spooky stories. Definitely get those ready for me. Get them sent and I will put them on the air. I promise. But I need some ghost stories and you all are not coming through yet. So, so if you have a ghost story, get on it. Start writing your Gmails and send them to me at SinisterStoryHour at gmail.com. I think that's it. Um, you can always support the show for as little as 99 cents. We will actually be starting to send out stickers and small things like that for the 99 cent supporters. So for 99 cents a month, you can get yourself a cool thing like a postcard or a sticker from me, Steph, personally. So that's pretty cool. Um, and as always, the, the larger participators, you can get some bonus content things like that, access before the fact. So yeah, exciting things happening at Sinister Story Hour. So thank you so much to everyone who is supporting. How would you like to live on an island? When I think of living on an island, I'm like, yes, sign me up. I'll take it. I'm there. I, I'm actually already on the island the minute it, it came up. So this island actually includes a main house, a dining hall, a library, a chapel, a boat dock, a lighthouse, and a recreational area. So that even sounds better. I'm definitely there. You can also learn to play an instrument each day. You can play in a band. They actually have an island band where you can go and be a part. You'll get three meals a day. You can actually do training, uh, military training, or any other kind of education that you want to pursue. There are quite a few different routes you could go with your education as well. So, I mean, I'm still in, right? I, I don't know about you guys. And then on the island, there are actually even some celebrities that live there with you. This sounds pretty elite. It sounds like a big deal, which it is a big deal. The island is actually Alcatraz, if you hadn't guessed. So I don't know if you guys were in it before, but I've dropped out. I'm probably not going to head off to Alcatraz with you. I'm sorry. So Alcatraz, as we know, has such a huge, rich history. There were some different reports. I wouldn't say that they were necessarily contradicting or anything, but there were different reports. And so we will run into a little bit. I used a pretty limited source, number of sources for that reason. In 1775, a Spanish explorer named Juan Manuel de Ayala actually mapped and christened the island with the name La Isla de los Alcatraces. Now this means the island of the pelicans. These birds were everywhere. And so that's actually why it became known as Alcatraz. In 1850, President Fillmore signed an order that reserved the island for only military use. During the 1850s and the Gold Rush era, a fortress was constructed and some 100 cannons were installed around the island for protection. Now, that's a lot, and it might have been overkill, just a titch. During that time, Alcatraz actually became the home of the West's first operational lighthouse. Fort Alcatraz also had a three-story citadel that served as an army barracks. It was designed to hold as many as 200 soldiers plus provisions, and it was meant to stand up to a four-month siege with provisions with 200 people. So this is huge. I mean, that's a huge place. It was soon recognized as the most powerful coastal defense in the West. And I'm not surprised with facilities like that. That's insane. And especially if you think back to the time period of the 1850s, that's a lot. The fact that the island was isolated by cold, choppy waters really made it the ideal location for this type of thing. But soon they realized that this was maybe not as necessary as they once thought it was. And they kind of took on a different mentality that not only is this the perfect place for a place of defense, but this is really the perfect place for a prison. Who's going to be able to get off of this island once we put them on? And so that's actually what literally began to happen at that point. 
at that point. Other forts began to send their deserters, escapees, and less desirable residents. So from the start, it was really kind of known that Alcatraz was the spot for those that just weren't going to be contained. So they are sending basically the worst of the worst, even from the start. In 1861, Alcatraz took on a new role when it ended up being put to use instead as a military prison for the Confederate sympathizers and the citizens who were accused of treason during the Civil War. Now, that added a whole new interesting element to it. If you think about it, there were at the time people that were supporting the Union and the Confederates, and so it was really just such a crazy time. And if you think about both having Union and Confederate supporters along the California coast, and then they're putting people into the prison who were Confederate sympathizers or people who were um, residents of California that were being accused of treason during that time. So it just seems like such a crazy time with all of these different people, all of these different views, um, and a lot of tensions building. Now, remember, California was a union state, and um, they were definitely trying to fortify this place so that nobody was going to be able to. After that, Alcatraz also housed some Native Americans. Now, a few sources I read said that it was Native Americans who were considered to be rebellious during disagreements over land. That to me means we took their land and then we locked them up. And I'm probably right. I mean, really. But there were other places who were saying, there were other sources saying that some of the natives that were being locked up were actually some pretty bad people. The cavalry would often use Native American scouts and those who were convicted of any crimes were often sent to Alcatraz. There they would, of course, live next to the worst of the worst, the murderers, rapists, the thieves. One of the first natives to arrive to Alcatraz was nicknamed Tom. He was a Paiute who was transferred from Camp McDermott in Nevada in 1873. He had killed a number of his own people, and the Paiutes had turned him over to white authorities. He was transferred from Nevada due to his declining health. He wasn't doing well in Nevada, and so they thought, let's send him to Alcatraz. Once he was at Alcatraz, they basically let this man walk freely, and he seemed to actually perk up. I mean, he actually, I think it was more of depression than anything else that was his declining health matter. But he seemed to actually perk up once he got to Alcatraz and he was doing pretty well. Unfortunately, one day he actually struck very quickly and injured some guards. There was a guard that had turned his back on him and Tom grabbed some bricks from a nearby pile and he started bashing in the guard's head. I did not find in any sources whether he actually killed the soldiers or not. It never said that he did. And so I'm going to actually say that he didn't, but I don't know that for sure. But before that could actually get worse, I guess. I mean, not that it can get a whole lot worse, but before it could actually get worse, one of the guards gr tried to intervene and Tom was throwing bricks at him as well. Finally, the guns started firing, and it took six bullets to stop Tom, and he was actually killed dead. Now, over the next two decades, hundreds of Native Americans would actually be sent to Alcatraz, and like I said, when I first hear that, I mean, it makes me irate, because we most likely took away their land, and we sent them to Alcatraz, but according to these sources, it was saying that some of them were actually accused of mutiny, campaigning against the army, or escaping other prisons. So maybe there were some of them, after all, that did deserve to be in Alcatraz. I don't, I don't know. Now, in 1898, the U.S. began a new conflict with the Spanish-American War here. The role of Alcatraz, as always, it just keeps evolving, right? And so during this time, it got pretty ugly. Alcatraz had typically housed about 100 men around this time. Due to this happening, there were thousands of soldiers going back and forth through the area. 